nearly. That's it. It's being recorded now. Hold on one sec. Someone just knocked at our door. Sorry. Someone came to my door on a Segway. That's exciting. Um, so uh, uh, this is the June 8th meeting. This is recorded. Um, there's uh, a couple of topics. Jason's going to be a little bit late. What his topic was, we, we brainstormed yesterday about some next steps for the prototype, um, what we're aiming for. He was going to cover that. In the lead into that, so Devin, you had a question about um, external LCD and kind do you want to go over that yeah i was just curious if uh that's something that would be an acceptable pr to put up with for uh just being able to connect to an external etcd cluster and as a follow-up i was curious if there's any known reason that kind would not work if we were to try to do that uh so on the first question i feel like in last meeting we definitely act that you know having a couple of flags that will allow you to bypass the embedded etcd and connect to an external one like the minimal set of flags that was something we all agreed to be reasonable okay good as far as kind there's no reason it couldn't um i'm a little hesitant to like we kind of said that a couple times like um we think you should be able to there's no reason right now it wouldn't it's not a direct primary uh prototype um, use case, but we would absolutely um, put, and I actually have this going on right now in the, um, so I'm fleshing out a little bit more of the API server uh, use cases, and I've recorded the, you know, the minimal API server should be interfaces that let you start a cube API server and inject your code, things I have written actually, um, don't have it pushed as a PR yet, but I was kind of writing down some of the examples folks have given of things they'd like to stub. So today, to stub the Cube API server, you gotta cut a bunch of stuff out and you can start layering it. That layering is pretty complex. It's somewhere between, you know, I'd probably say, to realistically build a Cube API server that does a bunch of the stuff, you've got four or five different levels of abstraction of interface injection, and then you're cobbling together a bunch of stuff that doesn't really want to. Um, my, I think like the, I'm starting to like think about how we would go down this path um, in the in cube and what the cut lines would look like. We've done a couple of experiments like this in the past, but effectively, you know, the the list I have is like you know it's moderate boilerplate, fifty to hundred lines of code. I can start a cube compliant API server. Um, I can add or I can bring in my own custom types which would just be like you know, standard built-in cube types, similar to what you do in an aggregated API server. Um, so that means we're using like the registry and bowls, uh, registering it into API installer. I'd be able to do just CRDs, so I could cut all everything but CRDs out. Um, I could be able to do aggregated API servers. Um, I'd be able to reuse all the quota rate control party and fairness stuff. That's pretty straightforward, um, but some of that is coupled to the fact that it is a cube api server so if you wanted to hard code some of those or have a different implementation you'd effectively like you'd be dealing with like the i don't want to say rat's nest but it's the rat's nest of uh the cube api server start so clean cut lines where you could layer types make a choice um, figure out all the cut lines if you wanted to replace some of the deeper interfaces and so like deeper interfaces the examples i was thinking of were storage uh, so that's kind uh, if you wanted to replace the etcd stub and, and again like the cube interface that exists today for that is the etcd 
uh, storage interface that's designed to work with etcd kind of shown that you can do it with others we've you know i've seen a couple of prototypes i've spent time looking at um what it would take uh, you don't actually have to support watch technically on the server side in order to make an informer work you just have to have the right approximate behavior so there's some there's some things that we could do there to improve but yeah the storage interface would be one possible stub our back um, this is good because I'm not reviewing my doc as I'm going. I'll put this up later. Um, maybe I didn't. Oh, it's the doc. Um, RBAC, um, emission control, potentially HTTP middleware, uh, the core cube controllers. Like there's a couple of them that do things like register themselves in etcd with least objects so that you can get you know, uh, service implementation and know what the API servers are. That's almost like an optional bit. Today, that's all deeply coupled with package master. So just trying to get like enough to where I could start sketching out custom requirements. And then the doc would then, I'd start to propose maybe some interfaces. But yeah, like today, Devin, I'd say you could stub it out if you wanted to in your own fork. I don't know if we want to merge it yet, but if some if there's enough people who wanted to play around with it and we wanted to use it as an example of what the interfaces would need to be, I think that's worth it. I do think, all right, I think that that's not completely um, out of bounds. I probably want to say like it should have a purpose that's connected to one of the 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 goals, and that could be like the the high scale logical clusters, for instance, which we've talked about. Um, and it, it'd be good like if if somebody wants to go do that prototyping and try that out to come up with a really concrete use case that is the reason for it and tie it to like one of the investigations and then we can like use that as the avenue for exploring it like uh, i know you and i were talking about the what if i wanted to have over one million etcd objects um would you be able to use the controller pattern against it what kind of controllers would you run against it or you wouldn't want to run controllers with it but you still want the declarative story what does what does that do for the model um that's like a, a really good meta discussion that i think you know, as we get crisper about what use cases like a KCP like thing or control planes might want, that's going to be a good one. There's another open question. This was brought up yesterday, actually, by somebody talking about the same topic. Was um, uh, if we have if you if you have like a KCP kind of like control plane, but you want a, a system of record that integrates well. Maybe we're thinking about it wrong in that the KCP layer isn't necessarily the is the source of truth, but it's not the high scale layer. The high scale layer is a service, and instead of making, you know, like instead of us figuring out how we go um, make controllers work against super high scale cube API servers like ten million or hundred million objects, we instead flip it around and say, well, here's how you can get a controller from a whole bunch of different control planes. And here's like the controller pattern that you use where you have a system of record for millions of objects or something where you're not pulling the whole, um, like, so each, say you have oh, 100,000 uh, little control planes sharding different parts of your problem domain. Could you pull all those together and use that as an input for a controller that also is talking to different backend APIs that might actually have millions or tens of millions of objects without having to pull all of them in memory. Um, so like that could be, I would probably say that's under logical clusters because logical clusters is the only one right now that talks about sharding really. Um, I think that's, uh, yeah. So we talk about sharding in there. So maybe if you want to, if you go down that path, if you do it, um, if you think about it, trying to figure out a way to frame the problem you're trying to solve in, um, and one of the investigations as a sub will be really helpful. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're, it was mostly something that we wanted to play with. Um, we're going to try to set aside a little time to experiment. I don't know how we'll find enough time, but we're going to try. Um, and, so that's good. Thank you. That doc sounds interesting. Yeah, and it, it keeps coming up. Like uh, we don't. There's nothing really that talks about like sharding use cases of how you'd move data. And I think it comes down to uh, what types of APIs make sense as declarative config based, and what types of APIs don't even a list of some examples in both columns there. So like, um, why do I, why are my services on a cube cluster? Like, a, why are my deployments a list? Because most people have a small number of deployments. Um, 
conversely, the example we were using before was like identity management at a company. I have millions of group user bindings. It's not really a great model to put into a cube thing, but you can. You just know that you'll hit scale limits at some point. Either we would say, oh, well, this just isn't a problem that fits because no one's doing declarative user mapping. Um, they're doing that through LDAP or through um, you know, SQL at this point. Therefore, if someone wanted to build that API and expose it, you'd really most of the times just end up syncing to that. What does that sync process look like? So, um, and yeah, Devin, if you want to, if you want to tackle the the um, the external etcd thing, um, I think everybody's in favor of it. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, then the next topic, or uh, Jason, now that you showed up, uh, do you want to cover the summary that you were going to give of, um, of our group chat yesterday? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, apologies in advance if you've already talked about any of this. Uh, we talked yesterday about uh, sort of next steps, next demos. Um, rather than, I think, uh, I think I have decided rather than try to go very general right away, uh, I think it would be useful to get deployments working and moving, uh, daemon sets working and moving, uh, maybe one or two or three other types to get sort of one, types that we know will have different um, different uh, multi-cluster scheduling characteristics. And then from there, try to generalize to say, like, oh, this is the pattern we would want to use for uh, this type of COD thing, or this is the type of thing we'd want to be the default. Uh, strategy when somebody doesn't tell us. One really useful thing that came up in that talk that we had yesterday was, uh, so I had, I've been hitting a wall trying to get the dependency, the, the detected dependencies of objects. So like if I have a pod, uh, instead of just randomly scheduling it, schedule it to where its service account is, schedule it to where its volumes are, or at least schedule them all together. Um, that got really complex talking about uh, RBAC roles and role bindings and cluster roles and cluster bindings, cluster role bindings especially, because uh, cluster roles and cluster role bindings are cluster-wide, as you might expect from the name. Um, and that got kind of messy uh, to think about. So instead, I think we decided we're just going to say, for now, at least cluster roles and cluster role bindings are not in scope. That probably cuts out a lot of well, a certain number of controller use cases for now, like you wouldn't be able to give KCP a controller uh, workload and have it transparently multi-clusteredly scheduled. Um, if it expects to be able to talk back to that KCP and talk to things across namespaces, that's not going to work. Uh, but I think that's a useful de-scoping to get to be able to unblock us uh, to be able to make other progress. And then we can come back to how to write a controller against KCP uh, a, a multi namespace, a cross, a cluster. What is a cluster anymore? But a cross namespace wide uh, controller against KCP probably belongs running directly against that KCP from external to it, instead of giving the deployment, describing that controller to KCP, having it schedule it to a cluster or a location, whatever we call it, and then having it talk back to KCP to try to schedule other stuff. I don't think that's going to be the, the path we go forward with. So um, that descoping and prioritization should unblock uh, some progress, which will be good. Um, and I think we have some vague sort of seeds of ideas of how to write controllers uh, or how to run. Not writing controllers would be the same, but how, where to run, how to run, how to, how to have a controller talk to KCP to do meaningful work. Uh, we have some other ideas, uh, sort of. And I'll, um, I'm going to note these in the uh, end of transparent multi-cluster, like possible simplifications. Um, and the other one that I was thinking of um, is the one. The other thing was like scheduling policy. Like, let's think about the simplest possible policy, which is a global default, maybe a per logical cluster one, and then we know that we might want one for namespace. Like, we could imagine there being a equivalent of that for the namespace, which would be. Um, uh, for an example use case that we were giving was like a tecton 
pipeline might have one namespace that's targeting your dev clusters, one namespace is targeting your stage clusters, one namespace is targeting your two prod clusters in an HA config, and all the pipeline has to do is update the image in each, or you know, update the deployment in each namespace, and it just works, and then someone can go and get the different levels of access to each of the clusters through those three different namespaces. And you can potentially have like hard boundaries on the production namespace, which is no, you can't. You don't get access to that product cluster, but you do get access to the to the underlying dev cluster, so that you know you might see that. So, like thinking about that as an example, those three, I'll I'll write that down and like capture it as just like that's we're not gonna we're not gonna go deeper into field level yet or object level yet. We're still thinking about it as like how do we get the simplest possible move working? Yeah, and even even the simplification of saying, you know. Every, let's have whole namespaces go to certain clusters. It sort of isn't as flashy and exciting as the demo, as the HA demo of a give it a deployment and it splits it across two clusters, but it would be useful in a lot of cases and relatively easy to build. Yeah, uh, you, could still, you could still do the demo just by having that namespace be set up to two clusters down right. the road, and we'll uh, and we can we can imagine how that would fit in. Yeah, right. But we might we, we might have a mode, and that mode might be the default that unless you tell us otherwise, everything in a namespace will end up on the same cluster together, which is still pretty good. And or has still... the same fate. Yeah, like the default would be on the same cluster, but it could be the same fate. And then you'd say, OK, what's the strategy that applies for same fate in? So everything that can be split is split. Everything that can't be split has to be able to talk to all those. So it's kind of the same problem. It's yeah. just, yeah. Dude, I have a couple of questions um, mm -hmm. on that. To continue with the Tecton example, in the case of Tecton, I understand where the how where the pods and deployments are scheduled, uh, but where is the where is the actual CRD? Does that mean that the Jason you mentioned that the controllers that you're kind of leaning towards running the controllers on an external cluster against KCP? Does that mean the the CRDs are actually on that external cluster? No, so so uh, when you install Tecton on the KCP, when you when you tell KCP about Tecton, Tecton is yeah. just some CRDs and a controller that knows what to do with it, and webhooks, asterisk webhooks. Everyone hates webhooks. Um, so when installing Tecton, you would say, KCP, here are the CRDs I want you to know about, and it would. Uh, it could either pass those CRD, you know, store them itself and pass them down to some clusters, or it could just hold on to them itself. I think we don't need it to go down to the cluster because the controller running against that KCP would watch for new task runs. When it sees a new task run, it would create the equivalent pod. It would tell that KCP, here's a pod. And KCP says, oh, I know, I know what to do with pods. Uh, I send pods down to a random cluster where it executes and tells me its status. The status comes back, it updates the task run with that status, and the user looking at KCP can see that task run proceed or whatever. So it doesn't, the CRDs don't need to be passed down Yeah. Uh, that, if the controller is running against KCP. And, and a key point that was kind of buried in there that's really important, though, is that a controller has inputs and outputs. Today, most people assume that the inputs and the outputs are the same, and they only have one cube config. The right outcome, probably for almost everyone down the road, is uh, and like you know, service load balancer as a controller has inputs from the cluster and an output to a to a cloud API. So we already have controllers that talk to two different types of APIs. Another way of thinking about it would be um, where the controller runs is irrelevant. The controller's inputs come from one cluster or set of clusters, and the outputs go to a set of clusters or and all that and the, the mapping there is mostly a client problem done right. And so like the syncer is an example of that, but another example would be uh, uh, a deployment controller. There's no reason the deployment controller has to target the same cluster if the other assumptions that a deployment, like when it creates replica sets, as an example, even though I don't think we'd do this, you could have a deployment controller looking at deployments on one cluster, creating replica sets on another. That's not really interesting today because the clusters are the same. But the moment you could say, well, I'm actually taking my high level intent here and realizing it's lower intent, suddenly like the mental model of where a controller runs is irrelevant, but the two different like inputs and outputs being different starts being really powerful. 
So in, in Tecton's specific case, its input is task runs, and its output is pods. But just to be clear, it, the controller talks to KCP for both of those. It doesn't, it's not responsible for, I, uh, this is a question phrased as a statement. Sorry if that's confusing. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. So Tecton running against KCP would hear about new task run objects coming in and would translate that to a pod and tell KCP about that pod. And KCP would be responsible for, KCP and the scheduler sinker magic would be responsible for pulling it down to a cluster. Uh, it's not Tecton's responsibility, Tecton's controller responsibility to tell, to identify the clusters that being responsible and, and send them pods and do, do right. the, the rest of it. Transparent multi-cluster is making it so that other objects don't have to know about clusters most of the time. So right. like right. batch frameworks that want to run, uh, like if you have a batch definition that's run 10 billion of something, good luck running that on a single cluster. But for instance, you could imagine moving that up to the, K the definition of the KCP level, and then your batch controller is saying things like run 100,000 jobs on this cluster. Oh, the way that I do that is I create maybe a job object that we copy down, or I create a, a second CRD, which is like my sharded task run. And then a, a custom controller then goes and says, oh, well, I can reuse some of the same info KCP knows about, but I'll leverage KCP where it's good, and then I'll do the rest myself. So. I, I, we're not. I think we're pretty early in the use cases and examples phase. Um, this would be, these would be good examples to like write down and be like, this is a thought experiment that we're using, um, and this like putting it in the transparent multi cluster. So, right in, fa in fact, the yeah the 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 border between application level objects and and physical cluster level objects is quite moving. In fact, you can just define your own level of what you want to keep at the application level inside KCP. And 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 what uh, you want to send to the underlying physical cluster layer? I mean, it's everyone's going to have a different boring. application layer, yeah. right? And so, like, what well, that's the best part about this is that we can imagine like the the simplistic, which is just transparent cube objects. There's the next step, which is you start focusing only on the high level objects, and there's the mm -hmm. next level, which is you say, oh, I could design objects that are explicitly designed to work as like intent, which is the cube model. And I don't really have to get too worried about multi-cluster. How could I use that? Yeah, that's like where we're kind of just starting to really scratch the the idea bed. But so there is is the goal of not KCP or running against KCP. Is that a is there a goal of making that actually something that is transparent to the controllers of today, or the the yes. or are we saying that that yeah okay so I, I would say I would say another goal and I'll put this I'm going and at it this is a really good discussion because I'm it's reminding um, and that was my I second think, question where are you putting these <laughs> transparent multi cluster dot md in okay all right basically so I would probably say the example you just said is if I've written a controller that works against the cluster. A lot, we, sh we should say, like, a lot of use cases should work better or just as good if I, if I, all I do is target the controller at one of the logical clusters. And we need to think about and have some examples there, but I'll, I'll record that. And as is yeah, always I, the case I, with I, when we talk about transparent, it's transparentable. You can also pull back the curtain and do more complex stuff if you think you need to, to Clayton's point about the batch. A scheduler yes. thing, you 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 can't you shouldn't have to know that you're talking to a KCP that is multi-cluster. You, if you know that you are and you want to take advantage of that, you should be able to do something. But I definitely don't want Tecton to have to have a multi-cluster version of Tecton, of the Tecton controller specifically. It should be able to do that against KCP, and KCP makes it multi-cluster. That's the multiplier effect. Is we're we're looking for something with transparent multi-cluster that is an actual multiplier versus that you just got to go do more work. To get more work, um, so it'd be if we can use if we can leverage existing abstractions, pods, deployments, services. If we can cheat and bend the rules, logic in the sinker, or if we can selectively bring in a small set of levers, widgets, policies around those that let you do a very cheap tweak, and suddenly you get more powerful. That's what we're aiming for with transparent multi cluster. If it doesn't multiply, and then I think like the thing would be down the road, if we do, if we succeed really well at getting transparent multi-cluster, I firmly believe people will just write controllers against the KCP level 
because you'd say like, hey, go get me all of the objects that are that I should have access to across all logical clusters. And I don't really care which logical cluster they come from. I just need to do a little bit of a lookup and map them to the right place or uh, map yeah. them into what Devin was talking about, my global API for uh, you know user role bindings. That once we get to the point of like having enough use cases, those other use cases come more naturally because then you're like, well, if I have 5,500 applications and I need to go check the security rules that apply to the network policies of all those objects, oh, I could write a controller that then says, calculate the network policy for um, that would subdivide these, calculate the, um, visualize that, uh, come up with a, you know, uh, something else exactly. Yes, yeah, so, so here there is two, two, there are two levels as well, if I understand correctly, as you, you spoke initially, Clayton, about um, having a controller work uh, against one logical cluster. This would be the, the typical case where um, it would be transparent at first. I mean, where existing cluster would be able to work exactly the same way with KCP, uh, pointing to a single logical cluster. But then you have additional use cases like uh, um, being uh, using one, um controller to watch uh, every logical cluster or number of uh, logical clusters and then we start adding additional use case that would probably require um you know specific implementation uh, which are really kcp related implementations or kcp specific but but for the typical use case where you just point to a given lo logical cluster i don't see why um uh, controllers could not just point to KCP. Yeah, and I think it'll be like conceptual stuff, right? So like an example, and I was trying to think of examples that I'd write down. So like mm. in OpenShift, there's the machine API, the machine approver controller, which looks at node objects and compares them to machine objects. Those are both yeah. cluster scope, but it only makes sense because the output of it is approving a CSR. Um, so like, you know, uh, you create a machine, which results in a VM being created, that comes up, kubelet register, creates the node object, uh, creates, a, sorry, creates a CSR request, and then the approver says like, okay, uh, I see that you're a node. I know that you were created by this machine. The IP you're coming from matches, and also this, you know, whatever data I carry through that I can check in the system matches. That controller then says, okay, go do the CSR. You could run that against a logical cluster, but without CSRs, nodes, or machines, it's irrelevant. Mm. But like the etcd operator, I should be able to point the etcd operator against a logical cluster and it would create pods and if we do our job right pods get copied down so this is like and jason don't worry about this one yet this is the one where it's like the transparent pass through or the merging like i think by adding I'll, and i'll get the constraint added to the doc like i'll say something like 95 75 percent of application controllers when targeted at kcp just work i'll use the etcd one as an example um, which will help constrain where we go with like a second or third per type step, but we don't have to do it in a short way. <laughs> did that answer, did we catch all the questions, thoughts? Is there anything else we want to record out of that? I guess so. Um, did we already, did I miss the part where we talked about discuss server or service and traffic routing? Did no, so that's, uh, so uh, uh, Joaquin, Jason and I were talking about this. Um, you'd done the demo a long time ago, uh, two clusters, both have ingress. They both self-registered and we just showed like simple traffic. Um, we called this out as one of the issues. I don't remember which one it was. I think you opened it, is that correct? Yes. And then um, we know that kind of the first, so what we were saying yesterday was the first step is, could you move a deployment from cluster to cluster? And then the next step would be, could the traffic flowing to that from outside the cluster hit that? And so that's a combo of DNS load balancing per cluster ingress, per cluster service, et cetera. So that's a good, it's a good problem area to go explore because A, we know it's possible to do, B, we probably want to use existing objects as much as possible and see, given those constraints, could we then say like, here's a minimum path to do a prototype, just showing the, the concept. 
that then sets up uh, a working group, a further investigation. Probably it would be a subset of transparent multi-cluster, which would be uh, now that you can move a workload between clusters, traffic needs to reach a workload coming from outside the cluster, and traffic needs to reach the workload coming from other services defined in the like pattern. Uh, is that something like how much have you thought about this recently and like um, are there are there new implications in your head Raheem, or new things you've thought through recently not really i mean it's um i was just writing in that uh, issue of the happy path you know it's just north south traffic and checking your uh comments i could see the kubernetes global balancer this project no which is uh, and, it's really interesting yeah um and the the history of this was cube fed had this problem and then when we said you know what cube fed's just too hard like we were too early for cube fed we couldn't make all the abstractions work it was a push model it had root access on all the clusters it was dealing with api and compatibility um the the set of folks involved in the sig multi or sig federation at that point reorganized around like getting traffic to and so google had some projects um, the global load balancer project exists some people were using external dns so it was kind of a i feel like there's a research phase and i haven't followed up with those if anybody here has spent time with them that'd be useful but we probably would want to look through some of the old docs and be like what are what could we learn from um, the problems they hit at least in my head naively i really would hope that if you have an ingress at the top level in the KCP, we should be able to carry ingress through. When gateway spec comes in, we should be able to do gateway spec, carry that through. If you're doing service mesh or services, we should be able to at least fake out enough of that. So like you have to, uh, this is the problem we're not solving with a second prototype, but we'll be in the third prototype phase would be um, uh, two services in two different namespaces in the same logical cluster or two services in a logical cluster. They declare a dependency on each other, me mechanism unknown. They both get placed to clusters and then somebody needs to say, if you hit service A from, if service A's pods hit service B's service from their pod, how do they get to service B? How do we fool DNS? How do we do, um, like, do we do service linkage rewriting? Do we make DNS work? That was one of the things that was part of the original cube that actually was lying about DNS so that we were abusing the search path, abusing, using, it's all the same thing as DNS. Uh, we were using the search path so that if you said, I want to talk to KCP, um, like if you talk, if you wanted to talk to service foo, on the search path would be a prefix that would route you to the other cluster if everything was set up correctly. I don't really know that, like thinking about like where we've gone from mesh, like if I have a service on cluster A and a service on cluster B and I'm talking to KCP and I want them to talk, I probably want them to talk with the same assumptions that you would get on a single cube cluster, which is not publicly accessible on the internet. Um, spoofing, man in the middling should be problematic or difficult at best uh, or at worst. And at best, it probably logically, like you want to have some level of, whether it's Submariner, um, uh, you know, direct service to service reachability, which I know some people do this. Like, so this is kind of that whole like tip of the iceberg where what are the axioms we would put in place? My thought was to put axioms in place around what we want the user to think about so they don't have to change their assumptions. And then the goal of all the technology is to go make those assumptions work, whether we layer or whether we go and take huge chunks out of Cube and we're like, Cube sucks, we're going to fix Cube. Um, and uh, like, I think being an orchestrator of Cube gives us a few advantages. Like we, we need to, our goal isn't to directly manifest what's in the KCP level in the underlying clusters. We are allowed to change them as long as the semantics are preserved. So the sooner we get to like, What's the actual semantic we want to preserve? And like Jason, I think that's the, the the RBAC example is a semantic, which is the semantic is you have access to a service account that lets you talk to the control plane. That doesn't mean that you're going to be able to talk to the control plane of the cluster you end up on. As a controller, you actually do need to tell us which control plane you're talking to 
So what we've kind of said is we're not going to magically sync our back because the mechanism for telling us who you're going to talk mm -hmm. to requires some opt-in. I think there's something similar for services and network. Like if I want to punch through all the firewalls and run and talk to an ingress, I should probably reference the ingress. How do I do that on a cluster? Uh, you know, no one really does that um, because there's no feedback loop through the gateway API or through ingress today, like routes and OpenShift has it where you can go get the public name or the internal name. Does gateway have that? I thought we added that to gateway via status. You don't know. I don't know. I should check it. Yeah, and so that might be an example of like, you know, complications to the syncing process where you create a gateway definition. What is, it, is it gateway? What's the actual user facing? HTTP yes, route. It, it, it's the HTTP route, yeah. So we create an HTTP route, we sync it, we wait, and the st summarized status comes back up. And then maybe that has to go back down. Like there might, like, you know, I don't, I'd prefer not to have to have two loops, but maybe this is a convergence problem where you could say the public name actually shows up or can be made to show up because the KCP layer sinks down, status is summarized back up. We normalize and add something which can then put the right, send that value right back down the whichever leg of the pants it needs to go on to. Uh, mm. And maybe that that's like the service dependency, like declaring a dependency on a service today is completely implicit. Few people have added some of those like service binding and uh, uh, the Submariner work at uh, SIG Network's got the external service concept. Services can also be pointed at. So it's like some variation of those could be, we'd want to think about what the vehicle is. And the service mesh obviously has this. Um, and that gets into questions of, uh, if you don't ask for service mesh, could we use or abuse service mesh to do that content? So, so I, I would probably say we may want to file this as just a sub item under transparent multi-cluster for now. But it feels like it's going to spin out into its own. Like it's the first of the. Uh, here's the use case. Here's the assumptions. Here's the deep expectations we would put in place. Like um, services just work. Ingress just works. That's the design constraint. Can we do it? If we can't, what do we have to change about ingress service gateway to make that happen? Um, yeah. Uh, uh... One thing that stuck out to me when you were saying that was uh, you reminded me that we talked about this yesterday also. Uh, not just not syncing cluster roles and RBAC down, but don't bother syncing any RBAC down. Because uh, if, you would, if you need RBAC, if your, pod, if your pod service account needs RBAC, we assume you will be talking to, a, uh, to the API server. And if you're doing that, you should just talk from outside uh, to KCP directly. Uh, I wanted to call that out to remind myself to note that. Um, the uh, Aside from getting Tekton to work against KCP, I really want to see Knative work against KCP. And I think all of this networking stuff is like really the only hard part. Good news, the only hard part is really hard. Uh, is networking, which is always hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Should, should, should be a problem. Should be no problem at all. Um, but. Uh, I definitely think that the Knative controllers should talk to KCP. They they do the same thing that Tekton does, right? That a lot of controllers do. They take their CRDs, move them around, and then hand back, you know, regular Kubernetes services and regular Kubernetes deployments and regular pods. So they don't they don't do magic except in translating, you know, CRD to regular Kubernetes type. Uh, then it's up to KCP to do the right thing with that standard Kubernetes type, which, again, is the hard part. Um, but uh, uh, I think um, I think Tekton will probably be slightly easier than Knative because it only cares about workloads and generally not about networking or Although, more about storage. But yeah, and I mean, you know, there'll be some interesting assumptions that probably like we need a couple of these use cases anyway because there's some assumptions that we may just not remember. Like I've been thinking mostly about the pod assumptions. Like a pod can make a DNS call without any external dependency to the short name of the service in its in its yeah. namespace. 
what would it take to fix that? Um, you know, most people use either the local name or something dot namespace dot whatever. What would it take to fix that? Um, what would it take to make service reachability? But then the next level for a Tecton or a Knative is, in Tecton is probably a little bit more useful because it's a different kind of problem of what are the implicit dependencies that a Tecton pod has on a cluster that are distinct from kind of the general assumptions that we would need to be thinking about for other types of workloads? Like, hey, you've got a controller, you want to make it work against a control plane. Oh, here's the three easy assumptions that you can either fix and then just stop doing that, like just be explicit. And most controllers can be more explicit, um, like use a service, Ralph, use um, uh, like for pods and environment variables is like take an environment variable and say pod spec uh, in from uh, you know end source service value that has a lot of advantages because then we know that something's referencing it. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be some others that we're just not thinking about, like the reference to an ingress, which came up like four or five years ago. We spent a bunch of time talking about how pods could automatically figure out the full name of an ingress, and we just said no, it's just too hard. Um, OpenShift went a little bit further than we did in BaseCube because we had the data available, but it was still almost too hard of a problem to really solve at the time. Maybe it's time for us to go back and say, oh, well, maybe we need pods to support um, you know, some level of uh, you know, data injection that is mostly agnostic to the, the pod, but like a controller running on the physical clusters could actually go materialize if it had to, or maybe the syncer can do it. Yeah, and the, the escape patch is always, is, is still that someone could annotate some object with, you have a dependency on this object of this type, and the KCP and the, the scheduler system should be able to take that into account, uh, given some explicit, We'll never be able to be completely implicit about dependencies. There will always be some dependency that a user just needs to say, hey, these two things just depend on each other. And in practice, most teams already are doing some form of, I mean, every team does some level of explicit dependency to another team in a microservices setup. Mm -hmm. They're just, everybody's mechanism for signaling that explicit dependency is different. Sometimes it's a security boundary, sometimes it's a, like, uh, sometimes it's security through physical network access, sometimes it's, being placed into the same geographic region where you can access the data. Sometimes it's you get a token that allows you to access it. Sometimes it's you rely on a cube primitive to do that, which does some or all of those. Uh, we probably could make the argument that uh, either we pick ones that are based on mechanical connection, right? Like what's the mechanism whereby you want to declare interdependency? I can reach it, I can access it. That's effectively what service mesh is doing. I don't think most of those primitives are probably still useful on a cube cluster. Um, and so maybe there's, like, again, like a lot of the other things we've done so far in multi-cluster, there are things that could be tested or, or done in the community in these projects, and then we just leverage them. But all we have to do is suddenly tweak them so they're a little bit more useful. Look, here's the five mechanisms we detect, uh, because those five mechanisms actually work. Everything else is your mm -hmm. problem. Use one of those five mechanisms. Yeah. Although I do, I do kind of like the idea of forcing people to at least declare some interdependency. Like all of our magic happens inside a single context. If you want to cross contexts, forcing people to explicitly declare cross context connectivity has a lot of advantages because uh, you get a place that you can hang other meaning off of. Now. It can't be too generic or it falls into the like, why would I set this up trap? It just has to be just useful enough that you're like, I would do this all the time because it's so useful because of the benefit yeah. it provides. That's that's where the the default fallback to just scheduling a whole namespace onto a cluster is useful because you get you get something for free. You get uh, uh, non HA uh, resiliency for free. But if you just give us a little bit more information, we can make this really, really great. Um, minimizing the amount of information you have to give, give us to do the really great thing is ideal, but we should be able to do some amount of magic for free. Um, the what I was thinking of something else while you were talking about the native in Tecton. Oh, um, uh, Tecton is also not doesn't care as much about HA because of its like relatively uh, asynchronous, you know, 
a batch workload model. So Tecton is going to be even easier to support for KCP because we can just put it all in one cluster. And if that cluster goes away, you know, your your tasks won't run for a couple of seconds while we reschedule you to another cluster, but it's not like you're not serving traffic. It's just So that behavior yeah. is the magic of Cube, which is the 99% of the value of Cube is within a few seconds, the right thing happens, and the most time you don't think about it. That is our job. Like yeah. our job is to yeah. make multi-cluster feel like that and not feel like a burden. So I do think that like uh, I, I think this is captured in philosophy, maybe. Um, Maybe pull that up and take a look. Uh, one of the goals. Be simple. Uh, yeah, maybe we don't have a explicitly calling this out, but it's like the what is the magic we want? Is the magic is it just works most of the time? Um, and the mindset is yeah, like the the retryness, the failure. Like anytime we see one of those, I think we should hang on to it. And be like that's actually the thing that makes. Tecton. Tecton could lean more into that. What's the right retry behavior? How do you encode that in the Tecton APIs? Um, in Tecton's yeah. case, it already is. In some other cases, you know, people write objects that don't think about retry. Okay, let's let's get you into a world where you think about that. Then that just takes a whole class of problems off the table. And an admin can come and be like, yeah, yeah, go cancel this job and like destroy this whole cluster and everything just works is our like is our magic goal. Yeah. It's it's the same story as delete a node in a cluster yeah. and things just work, right? It, it's just that a little bigger, a little more complex. Uh, yeah, it should be easy. Um, yeah. We don't really have that called out in goals, but I do think that one, I think, is, a, is an analogy that we would use when we talk about why something is KCP or not, is does it help us get to the point of a cluster that can just go away? is one of those uh, heuristics. Yeah. Uh, and the the goal being that if you are uh, if you are architecting your app already to take advantage of, of multi-node clusters, it should not require any or much new effort to support multi-cluster things with KCP. If you're already it's certainly possible to write a multi-service architecture that actually everything has to be on the same node. Uh, and you, you've done it poorly. And in that case, you will still end up on the same node of the same cluster in KCP. But if you uh, uh, decompose things so that they uh, can work across nodes, it should also work across clusters with KCP, hopefully. Um, so I know I missed part of the conversation, so apologies if this is just restating it. But <clears throat> in order to get to that outcome, if you address sharing the pods that are scheduled behind a common load balancer that's accessible across the set of clusters and perhaps also being able to to guarantee that clusters to which pods or schedules have network connectivity between them whether because they're publicly routable or because they have some private network vpn mesh that's going to solve a pretty big chunk of multi-cluster app use cases and give you a lot of bang. Otherwise, if you don't have those and you're still expecting that users can both distribute a set of pods across the fleet and they have to manually deal with those other points, you're going to require a, a much more white box approach. I mean, what, what we built with open cluster management is very much assuming that you've, you've got a white box approach that you can view the inventory of the fleet, that you can schedule work across members of the fleet, that you can establish network meshes, and then there's not a lot of assumptions made about kind of the front end load balancers. If KCP is meant to present an API that makes more of this uh, part of the underlying fabric, you've got to address exposing the global load balancer for pods that are scheduled across multiple clusters and some level of guarantee, or at least the ability to communicate if there is a requirement that pods can communicate. Clearly stateless services maybe won't care but if you ended up having MongoDB replica sets and you've got a replica in cluster one and a replica in cluster two and a replica in cluster three, how do you ensure that those three clusters can adequately communicate with the right levels of latency, anti-affinity and scheduling, right? You know, do you want those to cross regions or not? Yep. I, I, Michael, I think you hit it on the head. It's that white box versus black box. And actually, 
one of the arguments is, is even Cube has that because you can absolutely go build horrific, and by horrific, I mean useful and productive things that are completely node aware. And a huge amount of people that I know that are doing the complex stuff in Cube are doing stuff like that, right? They, machines have meaning, they have uh, physical devices, they have characteristics. And then on the other extreme, you have the black box approach, which is, is just a pool of workload. Um, we'll always have both. KCP should tilt towards the black box. The transparent multi-cluster is tilting towards the black box side. And the OCM approach is actually complementary to that because it's focusing on the white box. Devin's problem, um, you're thinking about what you do with like cluster API. And this is stuff that was brought up in the cluster API nested is, is there a black box approach to some of the infrastructure side that's orthogonal to the app side? Probably, but it's a separable problem. Like we don't, we don't have to solve both of them the same way. We don't have to use the same tools for them, but we should have tools that can be used in multiple ways to solve different black box problems. Like the black box problem of, I just want to maintain a pool of connected clusters. And um, when I add a new pool, it's fairly easy to put them into the, the black, or when I add a new cluster, it's easy to put it in the black box pool and all of the constraints get checked so that it can be used by the black box application model. Um, that's going to lead very naturally to things like cluster pools and um, capacity pools. And it will also lead to policy based pools that still need to be implemented by a real white box approach because somebody at the end of the day has to say, like, um, how do I take a cluster and make sure it fits into this pool? I, I will I will maybe poke a little bit, though. I agree with the majority of that. Maybe the one thing and, and I'm not sure if, if this is a point where we are disagreeing or just to clarify. The surface area for how a consumer interacts with a black box versus a white box multi-cluster story, the fact that those might have different API services is completely on point. The primitives that we use to orchestrate cluster behavior of the physical clusters, right, of what the logical clusters are managing, as much as possible, I think it, it is a desirable characteristic that we normalize those API and those primitives because when we operate this, we're still going to want going to want to have insight into its actual behavior, right? The operators are going to still want some visibility that below the KCP, there do exist these X amount of physical clusters, hypershift or otherwise, and that the those physical clusters have a certain characteristic of health and availability and uh, versions of inventory, et cetera. So while uh, the open cluster management is much more of a white box approach. If KCP is presenting a black box API and surface area for consumers, that's great. If we can look to normalize either by making adjustments in what we do in open cluster or uh, stimulating or um, influencing how KCP evolves to, con you know, to define these models, trying to get those to converge, I think is a desirable outcome so that whether I care about that API of what's happening in open cluster, or I'm simply trying to run an infrastructure that is operating uh, underneath the KCP layer, that I can do that in a consistent way. Yeah, and I think um, convergence on actuatable things is I think how I'd summarize that second bit. It's like, we wanna have things that are orthogonally actuatable and we wanna have tools that work well. And then we wanna make sure that you don't have to relearn um, the same concepts over and over. So even when you are doing, you want to have the minimal set of concepts for multi-cluster, um, but you also want them to have kind of a, a strong one. I unfortunately have to drop, uh, this was a great chat today. Um, uh, Jason, David, it was, uh, if you want to do any follow-up, I would definitely leave that so early, so sorry. Yep. Uh, the only other thing left on the agenda is uh, TGIK, TGI Kates, this, thank goodness, it's Kubernetes, I guess, uh, is on Friday. It's a stream. They're going to talk about KCP and dive into it and see if they can use it or break it. Or I'm not exactly sure what to expect, but I'll be there, and uh, hopefully it goes well. Uh, so if you're interested in watching, uh, make some popcorn, come join us. Uh, if not, it's recorded, and you can watch it later also. Um, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I think that's it, and we'll, uh, we'll see you on the Slack or here next week.
or issues or pull requests or anything you want. Thanks right. for keeping this open for letting people listen in quietly for the first time. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for thanks for joining. See you, everyone. Okay. Bye.